To have a job just to be employed is dignity. Being able to provide a roof over my head, to feed myself, to clothe myself, to very basic things. That's dignity and that's self-worth and that, that employment means more than just having a job. I agree. Um, I think it's also about the quality of the work or the service that you're providing. When I go into a work environment, I keep in mind what I can bring to an employer and also the things that fulfill me as an employee. Have you all experienced the discrimination because of who you are? Absolutely. Whether it was because I was gay, I live openly with HIV, and that became a factor at some point. You know, they may not, you know, express it verbally that this is what I don't like about you, but, you know, the way that I present myself speaks volumes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I almost lost my first job because I was identified as a lesbian and somebody tried to talk the supervisor into firing me before my probationary period was up. And I understand what you're saying about the way you present because I've always presented the way I dress now pretty much and that was not acceptable. People didn't like the way I looked or the way I wear my hair. And then more discrimination based on being transgender. It happens on so many different levels. Um, it, it just rings an alarm in your mind because it lets you know that you're not, society is not as far along as we thought we were. The message is always, we're equal, we're equal, everyone's equal, but that's not the case. I think that's important, Jamika, because I think often people don't realize how expansive LGBT discrimination is in the workplace. I think when you have the conversations, people immediately want to go, it's 2018, that never happens. Your sexuality or your gender identity or, mm -hmm. you know, having HIV, that has nothing to do with the job that you have. And so often we have to help folks understand what discrimination looks like. So. There's also the flip side of being someone who passes, right? Mm -hmm. And so the assumption being made that I'm heterosexual and then finding myself in a situation where the dialogue happening around me is, is homophobic and the assumption is I'm straight right. and what do I do? It's suddenly a me against them kind of moment and it's like, do I speak up for myself right now? Or do I not? Do I want to keep this job? I definitely understand. And we sometimes hear people say, well, um, particularly with employers and coworkers, why do people have to know? And it's like, when I'm working, I want pictures of my family yeah. mm -hmm. on my desk as well. Yeah. Like you have pictures on your desk. Mm -hmm. So Sean, when you transitioned on the job, would that be the right way to say yes. it? Yes. Okay. Um, why did you feel it was necessary to do that? Because I wanted to be true to myself and I'd spent enough time agonizing over whether or not I was trans and then when I came out it was just like I had to. I mean I came out as a lesbian and that felt really good and this felt really good to do. I just couldn't live in the shadows anymore. Is that scary though? Yeah it was it was scary yeah. especially when my facial hair started showing because I could sort of pass before that and it was the whole thing what bathroom do I use now and and all that. Yeah. Just the feeling of knowing that that you're in a situation where you might not really be wanted or accepted mm -hmm. as you are. And, and daily interactions get affected by that. Work gets affected by that. And my own motivation mm -hmm. gets sort of swallowed, you know, mm -hmm. under the weight of that. I think it also stifles your potential as an employee because how can I offer you all that I have if you are not accepting of that? it becomes a constant battle internally about what to do in order to stay in good graces. I experienced that deeply at the state capitol, just never knowing, you know, would this representative have a conversation with me. It's interesting because once they realized that it wasn't just LGBT mm -hmm. for me, that, you know, I had a voice on children's issues. I had a voice when it came to energy and different things like that. It was almost like a light went off. Mm -hmm. But it was still, you know, there were people who wouldn't talk to me, didn't want to have anything to do um, with being seen with me. Right. You know, yeah, that was right. a big thing is, you know, if we're seen with her, does that make us gay, that right. type of thing. So what type of advice could we give to other folks who 
are either afraid of discrimination um, or have experienced it on their job. Surround yourself with the people in your life who do accept you and do love you. And if that's not available to you, you know, there are so many wonderful resources now for us, right, to reach out to. And then another thing that they need to know is that it is wrong. Yes. Yes. If you're being discriminated against, you do have rights. You know, so you need to explore those avenues and understand, you know, what it is that you can do to combat it. And sometimes people don't even get to the point of employment. Like, that's where the fear starts. Mm -hmm. It's not even being able to get getting into right. the job. Getting into the job. Right. You know, often there's a level of privilege with getting the job mm -hmm. and then you got to work to keep it. But if there's a wall up that yes. even keeps you from being able to get yes. the job, yeah. like, that, for me, that's so disheartening. Mm -hmm. Well, what made me pursue my case was um, initially uh, the first judge who gave the order on my case, he was basically saying that I don't have rights, mm -hmm. you know? As a person who doesn't conform to gender norms, I don't have rights. And so anything that happens to you is okay. And so that, to me, was just a loud alarm. I could not ignore it. I had to pursue any forms of justice that I could. And Sean, you had a case as well that Lambda Legal worked, correct? Yes. I um, contacted Lambda Legal when the county wouldn't, well, the insurance wouldn't pay for any of my treatment. And I started looking into it, and sure enough, it was legal. Because it just, you know, not just for me, it's for other people who might follow after me too. Because it's just, why should I be treated as a second class citizen? Javier, your situation is a little bit different. Have you sued anyone? No. No. I haven't. <laughs> I haven't but I do want to dig in with you a little bit more about um, being out as HIV yeah. positive. The decision was more personal at the time than it was professional. It, it just, it, along with being gay and open, openly gay, I couldn't continue without the fullness of my truth just existing. You know, when, you, when you're hired for, for a gig, there's always um, a contact form, and on that is medications you're taking, anything they need to know medically. And I remember the very first uh, gig that I was on, at, and, and after being HIV positive, I came to that form and, and I just didn't know what to put. That feeling, that, I mean, because that's my health, right? That's, that's like, if there is an emergency, if I go down somewhere and I have to be taken to a hospital, that, that should not be something that's a surprise. But deeper than that, it's, it just shouldn't matter. And, and so that's really why I came out living openly with HIV, especially with the, with the shows that I've, I'm, I'm associated with. If I, can be, if I can be there and I can be doing that and I can do that show seven, eight times a week and, and I can have the success that I have, then there's no reason anyone else with HIV can't do the same. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to tell me I can't. So having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, mm -hmm. like I totally get what you're saying. But sometimes they're just so scary. Yes. Like I would find myself like really having to pump myself up. Yeah. It wasn't even necessary that people change their minds. Like ultimately that's what I wanted them to do. Sure. But more importantly, I wanted them to hear me right. and to yes. know this is how the decision you make is going to affect me, my family, mm -hmm. right. and people like me. Yep. So yeah, the, the courage to, and the bravery that comes with having those one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. conversations, you know, having to you know, fight for yourself, you know, having to say this in front of a judge. Well, I'm thinking back um, to realize that I'm, I'm just a human being like everybody else. And that's all I want. I want to be respected. Um, you don't have to accept my choices, but don't talk about me behind my back and, mm -hmm. and come to me if you have questions. And the norm is to sort of like, do, do go back to your buddies and chit chat about the person behind their back. But I feel like somewhere in there is, is the want to, to come up and ask the questions that you want to ask, to have the information you want to have. But it's like, how do we create 
a new habit collectively, right? That, that, makes, that makes it safe to ask the question and safe to answer the question and honestly. So knowing that we have experienced this and we're still here, have your experiences changed you? I never knew I, I had that kind of resilience and uh, courage. And I think also my compassion has grown for other situations that are completely unrelated. And I think that should be an idea that everybody should be aware of is that my fight is your fight. Sean, have you seen yourself change? Yes, I, I think I'm stronger than I was before and I'm, I'm definitely happier. Mm. That blows my mind still, because I keep a journal and I will write down how I feel every day and, mm -hmm. and how many times I've written down I feel happy is mm -hmm. like, it just boggles my mind. That is freedom. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, that is That's freedom. freedom.